Hello, people of God. How are you doing today? Uh, we are so grateful, so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Uh, those of you who are joining with us remotely, we want to say thank you and welcome to our worship service. Come on, can we give them a hand, those that are joining with us remotely? You know, we were really excited about gathering together this Sunday, together like we always do, together as God's people. And uh, then there was a decree that came down from the local authorities requesting us to avoid gatherings of over 250 people. And God has been on the move at Rev City Church, and so we've grown way beyond that. Many people getting saved and coming to know Jesus and connecting to the body of Christ and the family of God. Come on, that's good news. But what it meant for us is that we quickly realized that we wanted to honor the request from the local authorities. And so we've made this adjustment to be providing to you our worship experience remotely via the Facebook live stream and via the YouTube channel and other ways that you can connect to that. And so we're thankful we're grateful that you have chosen to join with us this morning, and we trust that our worship time has already been a blessing to you, and I hope and pray that the Word of God is a blessing to you today as we dig into God's promises for our lives. And how many of you know and believe it's a good season? Any season is a good season, but in this season especially, it's a good time to remind ourselves of some of the things that the Lord and the Word of God have to say about who we are in Him, amen, and about who He is to us. So we're going to continue this morning in our series, Heart for the Kingdom. And the kingdom of God was the primary mission, the primary message, and the primary motivation of Jesus Christ. And we want to be a church that builds God's kingdom. Because it was important to God, because it was important to Jesus. He used the word church twice, Matthew 16, Matthew 18. He used the word kingdom 106 times in the New uh, in the New International Version. It was his primary message, his primary motivation, and his, his primary mission. And so we want to be a church that builds God's kingdom. And you know, it's interesting as I've just began to recall some of the things that the Holy Spirit has been speaking into our lives through this series. That as I've recalled some of the things that the Lord has put on my heart and the Lord has been speaking to us throughout this series, I believe that, that the Holy Spirit was preemptively and proactively preparing his people for such a time as this. That there were some things he wanted to remind us of. There were some things he wanted to reveal to us so that we could be prepared to be the people of God and stand firm upon the promises of God when the world began shaking like it is today. And, you know, this is more than a vision for our church and a sermon series. This is God's invitation to you. This is what Jesus came to make you a part of, the kingdom of God. Colossians 1 has been one of our key scriptures throughout this series, verse 12 through 14. And verse 12 says this, he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. And Jesus did not come, people of God, to establish an organization or a denomination. He came to rescue his sons and daughters and bring them back home and to his family. Come on, that's good news. And aren't you grateful that the Lord rescued you and brought you home to his royal family? To his family. Listen, it's not just any old family. It's a royal family. And when this begins to get on the inside of us, when this begins to move from our head and to our heart, when we begin to realize that living out our faith is more than something we just do, but it's who we are, it's a game changer. And this message was important to Jesus. And the reason it was important to him is because he loves you. And he realized how important it would be to you. He knew that, that what he was coming to make possible to us and for us and in us was so big, so good, so powerful, and hear me today, so necessary for the days that we were going to live in that it could only be expressed in terms of a kingdom. Because you see, kingdoms are established and furthered by blood. We tend to be familiar with democracies, but the kingdom that you are a part of, the royal family that we are a part of was established by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And here's why that's important. I've been telling you, this is important. This is important because democracies, you can be voted out if you have a bad day. But I'm telling you, on your worst day, you cannot be voted out, recalled, or impeached. God sees you through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason you're a part of a royal family. And that's good news. Someone ought to say amen. 
So the Lord's been speaking to us about the kingdom of God and what we have access to as part of his royal family. And when we live according to kingdom principles, we have access to kingdom protection and kingdom provision and kingdom direction. And that's, that's part of what God's trying to remind us of, that in this season, to, that, that the world might be shaking in some ways, but that if we'll hang on to what he came to establish, what he came to invite us to participate in and become a part of, that he would be our source of protection and provision and direction. And last week, I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit led us to read all together as a congregation, knowing what was about to happen in the days to come. Last week as a church family, when we were still allowed to gather everyone together under one roof, we read Psalm 91 together. And God was reminding us and preparing us that he is our source of protection, direction, and provision. And I just want to read some of it over you today. Whether you're here or joining us remotely, receive this this morning. This is God's promise of protection to you in this hour from his word. And it says this, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Catch this. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand might fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand but it shall not come near you. Come on, that's a good promise from God's word, amen especially in such a time as this. And let me encourage you with something. These promises are available to everyone. But now let me challenge you with something. They won't be received by everyone. And there's a part that we have in Psalm 91, and it's found in verse 1. He who dwells. He or she who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. This is an amazing promise. This is an amazing promise. But our part to receive the promise is to dwell. Our part is to remain. Our part is to abide in the Lord and in his word and in his promises for us as his people. God's part is to protect. Our part is to dwell. And, and, and that, that word, that Hebrew word is yashav. And here's what it means. It's translated to dwell, but if you go look it up, the very first translation that you will see is to sit. To sit. And, you know, I want to remind you that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. And can I encourage you with something? He is not shaken. He is not caught off guard. He is not surprised by the coronavirus. He is not fretting. He is not wringing his hands. He is not nervous about the outcome. He is seated still at the right hand of God. He who sits, he who abides, he who dwells, he's still seated. Hebrews 10, verse 12, Luke 22, 69, Colossians 3, verse 1, Matthew 26, 64, Hebrews 8, verse 1, Mark 16, 19, Hebrews 12, verse 2, all scriptures that refer to Jesus as seated at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 10, 12, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. In other words, he came and he paid the price. He finished it all. He paid your debt. He made you whole. He brought you home. And then he went home to his heavenly father, a place that he's gone to prepare a place for you. And he sat down and nothing has shaken him or bothered him or worried him ever since. He's still seated. He's not caught off guard. He's not unsettled. He's not worried. And our part to receive the promises of Psalm 91 is to dwell, to sit, to yashav in the presence of the Almighty. In the midst of all the voices and all the calamity and all the hysteria and all the fear as the people of God, we have the invitation to receive the promises of God. Those of us who will dwell. Stay in position in the promises of God and receive the protection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's still seated. He's not caught off guard. He's not unsettled. He's not worried. In fact, I believe that Jesus saw this very thing. I mean this moment in time. 
and he cared enough about us to tell it to us. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And verse 9 and 11, or through 11, and this is Jesus himself speaking to us and comforting and encouraging the disciples with what he knew was yet to come, the day and the hour that would arrive that I believe that we are living in. And here's what it says in verse 9. This, these are red-letter words from, from Jesus himself. And he says, when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Come on, if you're with somebody this morning, look at them and just say, don't panic. Don't panic. God's seated on the throne. Don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first. But the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be, not might be, but will be, great earthquakes. There will be, not might be, but will be. Listen, Jesus cares enough about this to tell us about it. And he says, there will be famines and plagues in many lands. There will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. He says, there will be plagues in many lands. And you know what's interesting, you know what's even powerful, and you know what I draw comfort from when I hear Jesus comforting with us. Come on, he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He wrote the book from the end, from, he knows it from front to back, he knows the end, and in the end we win because Jesus wins. And so I draw comfort from Jesus telling us this, even though it's disconcerting news. There will be these things. There will be perilous times. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be earthquakes. There will be famines. There will be plagues in many lands. And you know what's powerful about this is that when Jesus was sharing this to his disciples, this was a new concept, plagues in many lands. Because they didn't have the capacity or the capability or the technology to jump on an airplane and to have flown from Europe to America in five hours or six hours or whatever it takes. They didn't have the ability to go from China to another continent in just a day's travel time. And so he's saying there will be plagues that will affect many lands. I believe he was seeing such a time as this. And he was preparing his people to stand firm on his promises in the midst of the problems. Verse 14 That same chapter, Luke 29, he says, make up your mind not to worry beforehand. And jumping down to verse 28, he says, so when all these things begin to happen, again, including plagues that affect many nations, many lands, he says, stand and look up for your salvation is near. Listen, I want to encourage you this morning, people of God, you are the people of God who have access to a God who is a God of peace that transcends our circumstances and our understanding. You have access to a God of protection and provision and direction. And in a world that is shaking, the world that's shaking needs a people that stand strong and stand firm and hold fast to the very word of God. Someone ought to say amen. It's a time to stand. He said, when you see these things, stand. So in some ways, we got to remain seated. In other words, don't panic. Don't worry. Remain seated. And then he says, but you also are going to have to take a stand. You're also going to have to take a stand. He says, when you see these things swirling around you, when you see these things, when you see the world panicking, when you see men's hearts failing them for terror, like the word of God says, when you see these things happen, he says, be reminded, I'm still on the throne, but be prepared to take a stand. Stand and look up. For your salvation is near. He says to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, underlines it and says, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. It says be on your guard. And I want to encourage you today, however you're joining us with some practical truths from God's powerful principles about how to navigate this season that are found in God's word. And and come on, before we continue to dig into these things, can we just take a moment and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts? And I'm going to pray over us corporately wherever you are today, but would you pray wherever you are today and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Invite the Lord to strengthen you. Invite the Lord to comfort you. Invite the Lord to, to encourage you today by the power of his word. So come on, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, what a, what, a, what a privilege it is to be called your people and to have access to your promises. And Lord, your protection and your provision 
and your direction, especially in such a time as this. And, Lord, we thank you for your heart in this season to bring comfort, to bring strength, to bring hope that's unshakable, God. And we thank you in this day and this hour, you are our source, our source, Lord, of provision and direction and, and protection. And we remind ourselves, Lord, of, of who you are and who we are in you. And we open up our hearts today to receive from your word, Lord, what you have to say, what you desire to speak to us. We thank you that you are our source of comfort, hope, and strength today in Jesus' name. And come on, God's precious people said, amen. It says be on your guard. And I want to encourage you to be on your guard about a few things. And number one is be on your guard about who and what you listen to. And I just want to encourage you that there will be many opinions about what is yet to come. But the only opinion that really matters is what the very word of God has to say about the future. I mean, isn't it true? Many opinions and speculations. I mean, you can watch one channel and one doctor with the same letters behind his name is saying one thing. And you turn over to another channel and another doctor with the very same letters behind his or her name is saying something completely different that contrasts. And, and so I'm just encouraging you in this season, become anchored to the word of God. Become anchored to the peace of God. Become anchored to the voice of God. Be in the word. Be discovering what God has to say about this situation because in the world there will be many opinions about what is yet to come. And here's the thing. We might could stand it except there's also many agendas. Who can we trust? Who's right? Who's wrong? What will, what will be to come? I can't tell you, but I know the God who knows. And as long as he is with me, and as long as he is for me, come on, there's nothing that we can't go through. There's nothing that we won't come out on the other side victorious for the word of God says, what can separate us? Come on, even death can't separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus. And someone ought to say, amen. Be on guard. Stand firm. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. Be, God, be on your guard about who and what you listen to. Whose report will you believe? Come on, who remembers that old song that we used to sing? Who remembers that? Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. And I remember Joshua and Caleb that came back from the, from the promised land and they had been sent out along with 10 other spies, to spy out the land. And they came back and they had a report that God was going to be with them and for them and see them through some things and see them to some things. And I'm just telling you, in this season, whose report will you believe? And what kind of a report when you go and you look out at your future and the promise that God has for you, whose report are you going to believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. Come on, I want to have that kind of spirit in me that was strong and courageous like Joshua and Caleb. That believed that God was so good and so strong and so powerful and so faithful. That even in the midst of real giants, real opposition, he was able to see them through and see them too. Come on, for the people that aligned themselves with that spirit, it went well. For the people who chose to believe the report that God was not able, will God really do? Will God really say? Are the promises in Psalm 91 really for today? If you want to be a part of that camp, listen, I'm warning you and cautioning you. Whose report will you believe? Lean on, stand on, stand firm, hold fast to the very word of God, his promises for your health, his promises for your family, his promises for your future. 1 Corinthians 16 is mirroring Joshua 1.9, which also says, I've commanded you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Every place, every season, the Lord is with you. Stand firm. Be on your guard. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. Joshua and Caleb brought that report back that God was with us, God is for us, God will see us through and see us too. In spite of the fact that there were real giants, there's some real adversity that we're facing in the world today. There, there are some real things that, that, that we could stand to get concerned about or fearful about if we did not have access to the promises and the presence of the living God. 
And I'm just encouraging you, even in the face of real reports, even in the face of real adversity, even in the face of real giants, we can stand firm, stand fast, be on your guard. About who you listen to and about what you listen to. The other thing I want to encourage you to be on your guard about is be on your guard about what you speak. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says that there is power, even the power of life and death in the tongue. And I want to encourage you that you, you might hear some bad reports. You might hear some things that cause your heart to maybe doubt or, 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 or question. But I want to encourage you, guard what you allow your mouth to speak. Even in the midst of maybe dealing with some of the fear or the anxiety or the uncertain, some of those things that, that Jesus gives us the opportunity to come and cast before him because he cares for us. Even as you're dealing with those things, just be mindful. Be on guard. 1 Corinthians says, 16, chapter 16, verse 13, be on guard about who you listen to and what you listen to and about what you speak. There's power in your tongue. And the psalmist said in Psalm 118, 17, I will not die but live, and I will proclaim what the Lord has done. Be on guard about what you speak. Choose to speak and confess the promises of God. I mean, come on, I'm just telling you, and with all the news that's flying around, I mean, come on, people. I was, I was in a restaurant the other night, and I was noticing, even myself, I was noticing, come on, I'm hanging on to the word of God and the promises of God, but I couldn't help but notice when someone would cough or sneeze across the way in the restaurant. I'm just telling you, because the spirit of fear is trying to grip people. And cause us to just begin to tremble and cause us to be paranoid and cause us to worry. Even in those situations, confess the word of God over your life. I'm just telling you, the enemy is going to come and he's going to try to lie in your ear when you start, when maybe you wake up with a cough or you have a sneeze or whatever. Come on. I saw one of my friends the other day and he posted, he said, it was a bad day to have allergic reaction at work today. Be careful. Be on guard who you listen to, don't let the enemy get in your ear. And say, see, you're, you're not going to make it. See, you're, you're over 70. See, you're part of the percentages. See, I mean, I'm just telling you, be, be on guard. Stand guard. Be on guard. Be alert. Who you listen to, what you listen to, and what you speak. Come on, when that voice, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. And let me let you in on a little secret. It doesn't have to come from your pastor, your preacher, your grandma, your Sunday school teacher, an elder, or a deacon. You need to hear yourself speaking the word of God, confessing the word of God over your life, over your health, over your marriage, over your children, over your family, over your community, over your nation, over your world, over your church. Speak and confess the word of God. I will not die, but I will live to tell of the goodness of God, to proclaim the things that he has done and that he is yet to do. Come on, someone ought to say amen. A few more things that I want to encourage you with. It's a time for wisdom over worry. And it's a time for prayer over panic. It's a time for wisdom over worry. Listen, there, believing in God is not an excuse to be dumb <laughs> or stupid or reckless. There's a way that we can be wise. I mean, come on. I was alarmed to learn at how many people weren't washing their hands before all this happened. <laughs> it's a time for wisdom over worry. And, you know, I, we were talking to our kids about everything that's going on in the world and trying to find and strike that balance of how much to tell them without overwhelming them. And, but to help them begin to understand the world that we live in that's a fallen world, but who we are as the people of God. Because, come on, they're kids. You can't shelter your kids like you once could anymore. They're hearing these things. On, come on, they're on social media and all these other things, and they're hearing everything that's going on in the world, and their schools are being canceled and this and that and the other. And so we were sitting with them, and we were just beginning to explain some of the things that are going on and explain to them some of the headlines and explain to them our response because we're committed to be a people that do not react, but we respond. We don't react by hoarding. We don't react by fearing. We respond by, Lord, what are you speaking and what are you doing and what are you calling us to do and be as your people? And so we were sharing these things with them and, and we had shared a lot of the things, some of the things that, uh, that, were, that were practical and some of the things that were spiritual and, 
And then we kind of left an open moment there just kind of waiting for a comment or a question or something to come back from the kids. And one of them kind of looked like for the opportunity to say something. And I said, Mom, Dad. And I was waiting for what they were going to ask on the other side, you know, just kind of thinking, like, have we done a good job? Was it right for us to sit them down and share these things? And what are they going to think? What are they going to say? And, and he said, Mom, Dad, is Walmart still open? <laughs> and we said, well, yes, son, it, it is. And he said, oh, we're going to be okay then, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's a time for wisdom over worry. It's a time for prayer over panic. When your heart is unsettled, turn to God. Cast your cares upon him. It's a time to pray. Jesus said, look up, stand up, look up. Even in the midst of being seated, even dwelling in the, in the presence of God, in the shadow of God, in his protection and his provision. He, he said, stand up, and he said, look up. And I want to encourage you, when fear begins to grip your heart or come against you, I want to encourage you to look up, and we look up by praying and petitioning God and by beginning to declare and remind ourselves of the ways that God has been faithful, beginning to just be honest and open with God about the times where maybe you're concerned about your provision or your protection or your direction. It's a time for wisdom over worry. It's a time for prayer over panic. And lastly, it's a time for serving over self. And that last part of that scripture, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 13 says, do everything in love. And I want to encourage you that in the season of opposition, we have a great opportunity. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, in, in the middle of those verses that we read a moment ago, in verse 13, he says this as he was talking about the perilous times. Again, the wars, the earthquakes, the plagues that would affect many nations. And he said in verse 13, right in the middle of it all, he said, this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. And I'm just telling you, anywhere where there's an opposition, there's an opportunity. And there's a world that's trembling and there's a world that's shaking, but this presents an opportunity because when the darkness is, is the darkest, the light shines the brightest. And we have an opportunity. Come on, as the people of God, as the body of Christ, we have an opportunity to be the source of, 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 of hope and tell them about Jesus. Why is it that you're not shaken? Why is it that you're not trembling? Why is it that you're not fearful? Why is it that you're still going about some things when other people are closing up shop and you say, because of the God that I serve. He's my source of peace. He's my source of protection. He's my source of healing and health. He's my source of direction. Whenever there's a great opposition, there's always a great opportunity. Jesus said, this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. And that, so that passage says, be on your guard, stand firm, be courageous, be strong, and do everything in love. And I want to encourage us as the people of God, look for opportunities to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in this season. Look for opportunities to shine the light of Jesus. Look for opportunities to be willing to be the one that, that checks on an elderly neighbor or that takes a meal to someone or that provides a provision that maybe even causes you to be short on something so that someone else can have something. And just watch what God does. Because when we leave, live by kingdom principles, we access kingdom protection direction, and provision. And I want to ask those of you who have joined with us today to stand up, and I want to ask you, those of you who are joining us remotely, you can remain seated, you can stand up, but we are going to pray. And we are going to declare, and we are going to remind ourselves of who we are and who God is to us. And I believe that if the people of God will gather together as we are, will stand together and will pray and petition God, I believe that God will do what his word says. He will hear from heaven. He will heal our land. So, Lord, I, I want to thank you for your protection, for your provision, for your direction. I want to thank you for those promises that are found in Psalm 91 and all throughout your word. I want to thank you that you are our protection from the deadly pestilence. You are our protection. We believe. It's, 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 it's not just something we read. We believe it today. That your word is alive and active and that your promises are yes and amen and they are for today. And we choose to dwell. We choose to sit. We thank you that Jesus is not fretting or worried. He's seated at the right hand of God. And so, Lord, we choose to, to not panic and to not 
allow fear to worry our hearts or cause us to live any other way but putting our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. And I just pray that if there's anyone who is hearing this today, who is dealing with the spirit of fear, we bind that spirit of fear in the mighty name of Jesus. And in that place, we pray and we declare that the love of the Father that casts out fear would begin to rise up, that they would be reminded of who you are and who they are in you and what you say and you speak from your word and from your heart over their life today in the name of Jesus. We commit to be a people who will stand firm in the faith. We commit to be a people who will be courageous and be strong. We commit to be on our guard and we commit to do everything in love. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in this day and in this hour. You are going to show yourself strong and mighty towards those who call upon your name. And you're going to use us as your people to reflect the goodness of God, to remind people of the heart of God, and to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is our opportunity to tell people about you. If you're listening today and you realize that you are far from God and that you need this peace and you need this protection and this direction that only comes from a relationship with God in Jesus Christ, we want to pray with you today. It's that easy. We're not saved by our own works. We're saved by the work of the cross of Jesus Christ as we just place our faith and our trust in him and confess with our mouth what God is doing in our heart. And so if that's you, maybe you're a prodigal son or daughter, you're, you once knew God or served God or grew up in the church, but you're, you're far from God today. And maybe fear is gripping your heart. Today is the day I know and believe that God is calling you back home. And he's not just calling you, but he's running towards you with his arms open wide to welcome you back into a relationship with him, this kingdom family that he's made us a part of. So come on, brothers and sisters in Christ, let's pray that with anyone and everyone who is responding to Jesus today. Let's pray this with them and for them together to support them and to, to affirm them and also to remind ourselves that we, even as we're growing in our faith, we never graduate from grace. And so come on, pray this with everything you have. Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could not pay. To make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you my life. I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, I'll never be the same. Because of the cross of Jesus, I'll never be the same. Fear and death and sin have no hold on you because of what Jesus has done and because of what you've just confessed in Jesus' name. Come on, can we give those people who have responded to Jesus a clap? And we want to encourage you. We want to encourage you. We would love the opportunity to follow up with you and connect with you. We have a gift we would like to send you wherever you're watching this from today. And if you'll just text new life, all one word, new life, to the text code 30500. We'd love to follow up with you and encourage you in your walk with Jesus. Come on, isn't the Lord good? Aren't you thankful for his protection, his promises, and his provision? Come on, let's worship him one more time together and remind ourselves of the hope that we have in Jesus.